Hey, I want, I want us to continue, you know, that word that Yahweh has for us. I think it's real easy to get puffed up in knowledge. I think it's real easy for us to say, hey, we have faith. And we do have that kind of faith. You know, well, we know what the Bible really says. And we have the moral fortitude and the courage to come out from what our churches and our family traditions were. Because it's not easy to do that. And I commend all of you who, who choose the gospel, the true gospel, over what everybody else believes. And so, this morning, as we were talking about, uh, I think I said, what we have is a failure to appreciate. In the culture that we live in today, and it's not, not different than other cultures throughout the world. I know we're in our little uh, tunnel vision box that America, how great America is. Well, America's a baby, you know. It's, a, it's an infant in the sense that other great kingdoms you know, the Persian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Egyptians. I mean, these weren't just little third world countries back then. They conquered the world. Napoleon, you know, Alexander the Great. These, these, this wasn't like, you know, America is the greatest country ever or nation ever. And, but that's because people don't understand history. You know, is it a great country in, in, in many senses? Of course it is. And I appreciate living here, don't you? But I don't want us to misunderstand or miscalculate and see, I let our point of view and our belief system go only to just this little bitty world that we live in. I know people that are, that are uh, let's see, sheltered or they believe a certain thing and then they get out into the world and guess what? They get beat up. And they can maybe beat up everybody in their family. But once, you know, a big fish in a little pond. What's up, my friend? I'm glad to see Jerry here today, and I'm glad to see Bonnie here today, So, and the rest of y'all too. So anyhow, what, what I want us to talk about, we've talked about that faith, you know, and we can be content with that kind of faith to believe what was not only prophesied, and that's one of the reasons why I am a Christian in the true sense, is because the Bible predicted so many things that were so exact. I mean, I looked into, you know, when I, when I get... Uh, Raised in church, and I began to look, but I didn't limit myself just to Christianity. I looked into all types of religions, the Quran, you know, the Buddhism, and I, I started to get into the the uh, the Indian religions and stuff. But man, I, it just overwhelmed me. I mean, there's so many, you know, uh, and I don't want to get into all those, you know, the Baha'i faith and, and Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons. And I looked at all those things. And what I discovered is, you know, modern Christendom is no less deceived than all of those. They just use the Bible to try to back up what they believe or, or they don't use the Bible, I should say. So we have faith. We have faith in things that were, that were prophesied and came to pass. Or, or we have faith in something that has evidence. It's easy to have faith in something that has evidence. And what Yeshua is trying to do with us right now is he's trying to put us in a place where we have faith where there is no evidence. You hear what I just said? He wants us to move. And listen, y'all that have been walking with me all these years, y'all know I used to didn't have a problem with faith with no evidence. My mouth would say it, and I'd go for it. I mean, I have done extremely radical things because I believe certain things. But what I have found in my journey for truth and those kind of things, if we're not careful, the knowledge of the truth of those things that have evidence will somehow rob us from the the empowerment that God wants us to have to have faith for things that don't have evidence. We will have to want to see and touch. And so my message today is an attempt to help us. And I know the beauty of it is I trust the Spirit of God to dissect this and to interpret this beyond my certainly limited abilities. But when God calls you to do something, he'll, he'll let you. If you'll just do it, he'll take care of it. Amen? Aren't you glad about that? 
So what, I, what I've been saying, I've said this for a long time, and you know, when Yahshua returns, what's he returning for? What's he wanting to find? The Bible says he's wanting to find faith. And, you know, uh, when, we, uh, when I personally was involved and, and started, you know, I, I got kind of, what do you call it, uh, wooed by the Word of Faith movement and some people. And I actually was on my way to be ordained with some people that I, I'm not even going to drop their name today right now. Am I, am I, is there anybody here I'm not affecting? Then you have a trouble lying to yourself. I found out this. Even atheists have doubts. They have doubt whether there's a God or not. They say, well, they, no, they, they doubt, yeah, whether there's a God or not. And I have, in my years, through ex my experience, which is only 60 years, but it's ahead of some people, that I have experienced doubt in varying degrees. I have seen people who were proud skeptics and, and they, were, they had their doubt about God and, and they delighted in their own intellect and they, they put them and, or pit themselves against God as if they're some kind of match for God Almighty. It's, it's hilarious. Most people like upsetting the faith of people who are weak believers. And they think that they come up with these brilliant ideas that uh, nobody's ever come up with before. That they have insights that are fresh and new. That's why I tell people, they say, you know, they th some people think that I just laid in a, a recliner chair one night and I had a visitation from an angel, so to speak, and he wrote all these things down that I'm teaching now. That's not true. I'm not the first one. As a matter of fact, you know, people ask me, well, who else is preaching this? I said, well, you know, names you may not know. Yeshua, you probably don't know. You never heard of him before. He preached it. Moses, we could go on and on. But God's word dismisses people who are scoffers at who God is and that God exists in Psalm 14, 1. And this is what he said. A fool is said in his heart, there is no God. Now, some of these people who are these scoffers and atheists, they just blatantly say it. But many of us blatantly believe there's no God by the way that we live in our actions. Is that fair? You know, come on. Because where I'm going, where I want to go, I, when the Bible says that if you ask anything in my name, or that nothing's impossible to him that believeth, after doctrinal things are settled, I have to come back and visit that. Because now I know his name. So the name ain't the problem. But I know that we are living below the potential of what God desires for us while we walk on the earth. As a young man, what I did, I did things that, and really I did it to consume it upon my own lust, even though I didn't realize it at the time. But you know, I was a young man. I was like, like remember I told you, I said, man, we're going to take a city. And then I had to learn that I had to take this city worry about taking a city but we were going to do it hallelujah there's another kind of doubt that i understand and know about and if i know it i know that other people who are humans and have breath know it i told somebody one time said listen we all have the same people in our lives the same kind of people the same problems quit expecting a sympathy card all the time well, I, 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 may not, I may hide things or not, I may not talk about it or whatever, but we all are in the same boat. Clap, clap. True? So we need to remember that. And so I know if, if I've experienced something, the chances are 100% that everybody else has too in some aspect. I know the story when I see... In my experience, when I see believers who get our eyes off of Yahshua in the midst of a difficult situation. I'm going to try to talk to, about, talk to us about these things. 
I remember when the disciples were in the boat with Yeshua. It's just always something that my mind goes back to. It's a simple illustration. They were being swamped by this big storm at sea, and they shouted, Save us! We're perishing! And this is what he said. And this is a word that I want you to kind of set aside in the back of your mind as I'm talking today. Why are you timid? Why are you timid, ye men of little faith? Why are you timid? I remember when I used to, I wasn't timid. And it might have just been out of zeal. But I wasn't timid about things. But as I grew older, I, become, I became more timid about my faith with no evidence. I'm very vocal about the faith I have that has evidence, but I've become less bold with my faith where there's no evidence. Does that make sense? Then you got Abraham. He was still Abram at the time, and he told his wife, listen, here he is a guy who was told by God that he would be the father of a great nation. And he told him that many, many years before he even had one son. As a matter of fact, we know his wife was, had, didn't have the ability to bear children. And he's so scared, or doubtful, I should say, he didn't want to be killed by some people, so, so he didn't tell them that Sarah was his wife. He said, oh, this is my sister. And you would think that somebody that had a word from God that said, you're going to be the father of great nations, would probably think in some way, shape, or form, you know, I can't be killed right now. Because God said, I'm going to be the father of great nations. I ain't had a baby yet, so this is my wife. What are you going to do about it? Because God said, I can't die yet because he hadn't done what he wants to do in me. Are you hearing my slow here? You know, how can you be the father of a great nation if you're dead? So we think that the faith would give him boldness that he wouldn't have to cow down to, to some people and say, Oh, 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 this, this is my sister. It seemed like he would have boldness in the face of adversity when he was threatened that he would say, No, this is my sister, and that's my God, and you better back up, Jack. No, I'm talking cockiness or pride or arrogance. I'm talking about a confidence in what God has said. Listen to this story. Mark 9, 17 through 26. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. How many of you ever had a son with a dumb spirit? <laughs> I know. I was like, hey, I'm relating to something right here. <laughs> and wheresoever he take them, he teareth him and foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. And they could not. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? Now this haunts me. Y'all know the second foundational principle is faith toward God. I preach it inside and out. I know, I mean, I mean I'm sure there, I don't know everything. I'm sorry what I'm saying. But I know that there are these basic principles of of that second foundational principle about confessing and believing and not doubting and, you know, speaking to and all those things. But, it, you know, it comes back to haunt me that Yahshua said, it's like a rebuke. Here he has his sick child. And he says, you ain't got no faith. Oh, he said, you got faith, you got a little. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he answered his father, How long ago is this coming to him? He said, Of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire, into the waters to destroy him. How many of you know that that old carnal, that old carnal thing in our children, when they get that dumb spirit on them? It'll put them in the fire. Huh? It gets them in trouble. Everybody have that before? 
So I want you to think of this not just as this infirmity that this young man had. Maybe epilepsy, I don't know. Obviously some type of seizure. And this is what he said. But if, you can, if, you can't, if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Yeshua was like, wait. If I, if I can. And there is a root of doubt that we most have. Yahshua said this to him. If I can't, no, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. That haunts me. Anybody else at haunt? All these other issues, you know, is that, okay, what about Lazarus the rich man? It just don't make sense. And what about this scripture? It don't make sense. Well, we made sense pretty much of everything. And the problem was not the Bible, but it was our traditions and those things that we couldn't get free from that made us not understand the scriptures. Most people say this to us now. That didn't make sense. But I'm still haunted with this aspect. So the father of the child cried out and said, Lord, I believe. I believe. You know I believe. Help thou my unbelief. When Yahshua saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more in him. The spirit cried and rent him sore and came out. Now, he had already asked the disciples to Heal his son of this infirmity. And the disciples could not do it. They'd done it before. Yahshua sent them out. And they, it happened before. So when he asked for, that, for the disciples to do it and it didn't happen, he began to search for Yahshua. And so he finds the disciples and he says, and this is how I think. Once I pray for something and it don't happen, it begins to cause me to have a lot of doubt. And as the word we talked about earlier, I become timid now about laying hands on people. I remember when I used to minister to the altars and stuff and all, you know, and I would anoint people with oil. I, I remember one time I, I anointed somebody with oil, you know, and I, I just happened to put a cross on their forehead <laughs> with that oil, and they fell, fell out under the power of God, you know. And so I went to the next person, I put another cross. <laughs> I figured that's the formula. That's how it works. Nothing happened. So I put an X. That didn't work. The, the last one over here, I just signed my name on their head. Hey, trying to get something to happen. You get what I'm saying? So we think there's a formula here or whatever. What if it doesn't work again? I'm going to look foolish. And I told you last week or the week before, I even have told Yahweh I'm timid because I don't want to make you look bad. I'm trying to protect this gospel. If I'm saying that this is the name and this is your name and all this kind of stuff, you know, and, and I pray for somebody and it don't happen, then that's going to bring reproach upon the gospel of what we preaching and your name. I'm trying to defend you, God. And remember what God told me? I don't need you to defend me. I said, oh, okay. And then each failure has the ability to create de greater doubt in the next attempt to have faith for what is unseen. Is anybody with me so far today? Can you relate to me? This is my story. This is how I have walked this out. Mark 11, 23 and 24. We've quoted it for years. We said it for years, especially during that phase when Yahweh was laying that second foundational stone in us. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea. But here it is. But don't doubt in your heart. But shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatever he saith. 
I like that scripture. I'm after that. The disciples doubted in their heart. They had unbelief. I believe it's this way with all of God's people. Usually we want to have a miracle so we can, it's some kind of ego or thing about us. More than having compassion on people and for the glory of God. Not always, but in the church environment. I think it's safe to say this morning that we all have our doubts. Are we honest today? Our Wednesday night group's real honest. Our Wednesday night group's real honest. I doubt. We have doubts with our faith. We have doubts about Yahweh. We have times doubts that he even cares for us. We doubt that he hears us when we pray. We doubt that he never does anything and intervenes on anybody's behalf anymore because of something I said about God interfering in the affairs of men, talking about the nations, not your individual prayer life and walk with God. This doubt is part of every single person who is the sleeping sons of Adam today. And I don't mean just spiritually, I mean in the grave dead. I'm talking about spiritually asleep. Ever since Adam and Eve first disobeyed God in that garden, they disobeyed him out of a dynamic that really didn't believe that God is who he said he was and that he could do what he said he would do. Otherwise, they'd have been a fool to, to do something that he said, if you do it, it's going to cause death. Can I explain that again? What I'm saying is, if Adam and Eve really believed that God was a God of his word and that what he said would actually literally happen to them, they would have never disobeyed. The reason they disobeyed is because they did not believe that God is and that he was and that he was a man of a God of his word and he's going to do what he said. Otherwise, they'd have to be out of their minds to disobey. It'd be like somebody saying, hey, if you do that, I'm going to kill you. And you pull a gun out on them like that. I'm telling you, if you do that, I'm going to kill you. If they believe you, they ain't going to do it. This means, yeah, yeah, I think that's simple. But if they don't believe you, they're going to say, oh, man. So that is part of our, what we have inherited, that we don't really believe God is who he is and that he can do what he says he's going to do or that he will. That's why we just do whatever we want and we think it's fine. Remember I preached a couple of weeks ago about God, your creator and owner. If you don't believe that God can do anything and is able, then you're not going to be able to have faith to think he can take care of your financial problems. I mean, kidding me? Do you really believe that God is the one who spoke this whole universe into existence and he determines who lives and who don't live and those kind of things? If you don't, you're never going to have faith for him to help you take care of your little issues. And that's where I'm trying to get you. Start focusing and appreciating and understanding and realizing and acknowledging who God really is. Adam and Eve, they, they begin to not really believe it. It's called sin, not believing. It's called sin. I told you that David was a man after God's own heart. Here he was, an adulterer and a murderer, and I'm not condoning that. I know people today, they say, well, the people in the Bible, they were bad people, but God still, you know, they were still used by God anyhow. You know, you can't be a sinner and God continue to use you with any interest in you. He may use you in spite of you, but listen to me. You can't do that. 
But I'm telling you that the reason that David was a man after God's own heart is because in here he really believed. He may have had a stumbling in the flesh, but he appreciated God. He acknowledged God. He, uh, he worshiped God. He believed him. This is sin, and this sin, I believe, is the biggest problem that we have, not whether somebody still drinks or anymore, or get drunk, or, hey, I don't do that anymore, I don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls that do, and all those kind of things. Are those wrong? Absolutely. Should you quit doing them? Of course. Drunkenness, you can't enter the kingdom. But what's most important is a sin that cannot be forgiven, and that is unbelief. Because the only way you can be saved is to believe. I told somebody, I said, your faith is misdirected. You can't have faith that when you die, you're going to go to heaven and then receive eternal life. Because that's not what he said. You're not believing what he said. He didn't say that was going to happen. So to believe something he didn't say, it's impossible to have faith. How y'all with me today? I feel like I'm, I'm trying my best to get this across to you today. The sin I'm talking about right now is that which attacks our belief in who God really is. This sinful thing in us will assault our faith and it will develop unbelief in our minds and we will be good people and we will believe and come to church and things like that. But we are so inundated by unbelief. So this is an attitude I think has developed in a lot of people in my experience. I think people will pray, and this is what they're really saying. God, if you love me, please show me by whatever it is you want. If you love me, see, you got to believe that God already does love you. If you don't already believe that God does love you, then what you're going to be doing is like having a miracle, you know. You're going to have to need another miracle to, to prove that he is. Well, I need another miracle. If you love me, please show me. Lord, show me that you love me, Lord. But give me a new car. Or it may be something legitimate. It's not the action that's wrong, but it's the motivation and the doubt that prefaces the action, are, are, and that is that you don't believe God loves you when he tells you, I mean, my God, what else he's got to do to show us he loves us? But if we don't believe that, then we have doubt and sin in our life, and maybe that's why he don't answer our unbelief. That's one reason. That's some good examples, I thought, to give you this morning. I think we all have been there. We all believe, but this, this, watch. But we get our eyes off Yeshua and Yahweh and onto the trial that we're in. We let our trial or their test or our storm, or whatever it may be, consume our visions, and it blocks out the glorious power of Almighty God who wants to come and show Himself strong on His behalf for our good. Heard a guy one time say this, you can take a penny, you can shut this eye, you can take a penny and put it over your eye, and it blocks out the sun. I'm talking about the sun, and one penny can block it out. If you and I continue to let what we're going through consume what we see in our vision of the unseen, it's going to block the glorious power of God Almighty, the uncreated one, to show himself strong in our situation. Amen. Thank you very kindly. There are many of us. 
who know what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk today about a guy named Zacharias. Zacharias was in the temple one day, and Gabriel appeared before him. Gabriel, the angel who stands in the very presence of El, he peered, and this is what he said. He promised to give Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth something. Who knows what it was? A son. Now you would think, if an angel came before you this morning, and you were barren, and you and your husband, or you and your wife couldn't have children, and you've wanted children for a long time, and an angel appears to you and says, hey, you're going to have a son. You would think people would be ecstatic. You would think they would have be full with joy. Because every day, for years and years and years and years and years, this was, and this was a devout couple, righteous couple. Every day, they pray together. And they say, Yahweh, if it be your will, give us a son. Give us a son. We want a son. And they had done that for years and years and years and years and years and years. And years. And so the angel shows up, and it's my opinion that the attitude that, that Zechariah took was this. Ah, it's too late. It's too late now. They were already past the time where people, the, the, the normal age where people ha can have children were, and who were able to conceive, they were way up past that. How many of you know in the Bible, you read the Bible, that happens a lot with God. He wait till you owe, Shaw. Glory to God. And Zacharias, like many of us, I'm sure, okay, me, I'm not going to mask it. I just reconcile myself to what I call reality. Let's get real. I'm not going to have a son. It's like I tell you, where I'm at, you know, I tell God this. Look, I'm, I want you to know something, Yahweh. I'm going to serve you no matter what. Now, I say that with boldness and understanding humility, knowing I need God's help and all that. But listen, I'm going to serve God. Whether you do anything else for me ever, I'm going to serve you. That's a done deal in my life as far as I can believe right now. You never know. But that's what I think. But there's some things that I have asked God for and asked God to do. I just get back to reality. Well, I guess it's just not for me. Well, i tell you what I think. I think that probably I just had to come to terms with Yahweh over the matter. God is sovereign. He can do what He wants to and bless who He wants to and for whatever the reason is, I haven't quite figured it out yet, but I just assume that that's just not Yahweh's will for me. And I think that it's just not, it's just that he wants to withhold that blessing from me. And to be honest with you, Gabriel, I'm telling you what, who I think, if I was there and I was Zechariah in his shoes, which I have been in a certain way, I'd say, well, and to be honest with you, Gabriel, I'm going to tell you what, i got to tell you, I'm not willing to open myself up to this roller coaster of hopes and fears and hopes and fears and fears and, that I've had. I've left that behind now. I've settled it. Don't go teasing me again. I love God. I'm going to serve God whether he does anything. But as far as me believing and having faith for that which I can't see, I'm just, I don't want to be disappointed with that anymore. And the whole while, it's always back there, haunting me. Okay, this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true. Well, I just, I guess it's just your will. When I should be saying, well, I guess it's just my unbelief. So what do I do about it? I mean, this is where we are. This is where our church is. This is where we're going. 
And this is what we're going to do. And if you doubt me this morning, I don't blame you. I understand because that Zechariah, he doubted the angel of the Lord. And I'm a, he's an immortal angel. I'm a mortal angel. And to the, church, the angel at the church of Ephesus, that word means angel. It don't mean that I've got these or nothing like that. But I'm speaking today and I'm telling you, you're going to have a son. Well, I don't know if I believe it or not. So what, what can that Zacharias do to teach us about our problem, our biggest problem, I think, called doubt? Doubt and unbelief. You know what it is. It's one of the twin sisters of the mothers of all sin. Unbelief and pride. Unbelief, that spirit of rejection, pride. The, the spirit of uh, unbelief, uh, doubt and unbelief is the, the spirit of suicide. And pride is the spirit of homicide. Not that you literally do it, but you're always doing things that hurt you. And you're always doing things that hurt others. Some of you come out of, excuse me, some of us came out of both mothers. We want to kill ourselves and everybody too. First thing I learned about Zacharias, because we, we look at these Bible people, man, we think they're like superheroes or they weren't human. And that's what I found out. There's not a person that I've ever met or that has ever breathed or been born that doesn't have and struggle with the problem of doubt. So you're normal. Well, I can't say you're normal, you know. And I found this out. In Zechariah, the Bible says that he was righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of Yahweh. He was righteous means that it wasn't just an outward show of godlikeness or, or godliness, but he, like the Pharisees, but he... Had it in here. He walked with God and he done, done so for many, many, many years consistently. The fact that a Zacharias, who was a godly man and, and kept all the law and did all those kind of things and his heart was right with God. For that guy to have doubt shows me that nobody here in this church is exempt from that problem. That's kind of good news. Look at other great women and men of faith in the Bible. They had, uh, they had doubt. They had, some, some people had not just a moment of doubt, they had months of doubt, years of doubt. Look at Sarah, Genesis 18. When the angel announced to her, to Abraham, I mean, that his wife would give birth to a son, Sarah was listening on the other side of the tent wall. Huh, that's, a, that's a wife for you, right? What do you say? She laughed because she doubted. She said, ha! John the Baptist, the son of Zechariah, he had doubt. Luke 7, here he is, man, in prison. They done killed James. So John says, hey, 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 go ask, go ask him if he's the right one. Because I don't think I'm going to get my head cut off if I'm missing, if I'm missing it here. Is he, is he the one? Is he the, the Messiah? And, of course, Yahshua said, Go tell him this, 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 all these things are happening. And then he rebuked John's doubt, and this is what he said. And blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. That's John 7. I mean, excuse me, Luke 7. He goes on to tell people, Yeshua did, that among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. 
He was a godly man. He was John the Baptist. I mean, he was out there preaching and, and wearing, you know, skins and eating locusts and honey. And they thought he was crazy. But guess what? He was a godly man. But he had doubt. So I'm telling you, and I'm trying to affirm in us, that look, everybody has it. Even these great men of the Bible that we think are great men. If Zacharias fell into doubt, if John falls in, fell into doubt, Sarah, I mean, we go on. We should be on guard so we don't fall and we can live by faith and not doubt. So my question is this, okay. We all got it. Everybody in the Bible had it. With the exception of Yeshua. So what causes it? I told you many, many times, you know this, that people say, man, I just saw a miracle. Or if God would just speak to me. I mean, I've even told God, Lord, I want you to say something to me. Show me a sign, do all that. Then, then I would believe. But the fact is, it don't work that way. Here's Zechariah had the Gabriel appear in front of him and speak a direct revelation from God. But he didn't believe him. Why couldn't he believe the angel? Because he'd already settled in his mind, well, that's just the way it is. I don't want to get my feelings hurt anymore. I don't want to risk doubting God. I'm happy with my lukewarm walk. As long as my bills are paid and my children are healthy and, and you know, we got plenty of money and do what we can do, then we're good. Later, in Luke's parable, we see of uh, Lazarus, Lazarus and the rich man. We see this lesson being taught to us. And this is what, in, in the parable, the rich man said, No father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And this is what he said in the parable, Abraham. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Of course, he was prophesying in the parable about him, you know, rising from the dead and the Jews rejecting him. But the fact is, that's not how we're going to get it. And I'm telling us today, I don't think doubt is a problem of evidence. I think doubt is the, the result of sinfulness in our heart, in our belief system, in our core. And even those who are righteous struggle with that thing in them and in us. So how does Zechariah's question different from Mary. Mary, she didn't get rebuked for what she said, but Zacharias did. Listen close. And don't let me bore you this morning. I know I'm, I'm kind of not rambling, but I'm just after something in us. Yahweh's after it. When the angel told Mary, he said, hey, you're going to be pregnant with Yahshua. And this is what she said. How can it be? I'm a virgin. And I can't find where she was confronted by the angel for saying that. Abraham laughed and brought up the matter of his and Sarah's old age when he was promised a son, but he was not corrected for doubting. But Sarah was. So I'm like, wow. Gideon asked God twice for a son. But guess what? He didn't get rebuked. I'm like, dang. Zacharias asked the angel for a sign, and he got rebuked. What's the difference? I believe it was something in the heart of Zechariah that didn't believe. It wasn't the fact that he just spoke words. But it was in the fact of what he believed and what he would do from there. Because he always sees these secret things in our heart. And I believe God said, Zechariah has this give up attitude. It's not going to happen. I tried it before. It didn't work. I'm going to quit attitude I don't want to go up and down the emotions anymore. Hope, you know, be a prisoner of hope. And 
And this is what I think. That Zechariah, remember we talked about last week or week four, Yahweh wants us to go to him first. But Zechariah was limiting Yahweh by the normal course of human nature. And this is what he believed. We're too old. It can't happen. Because they believed more in the fact that age, being too old, not having babies was a truth over the fact that Yahweh said, no, you're going to do it. Y'all hear what I just said? Is it, did, it, did I get clear? They chose like, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I'll, let me give you an example. I have a son with diabetes. Y'all know it. I can tell you something. I ain't quitting. I ain't quitting believing. I'm gonna say, well, you know, he's he's got insulin and he's got I'm not, no, no. And I don't think it's a God problem. I think it's a me problem. Maybe it's a him problem. All I know is a problem. And there's things that I that I'm, I believe God for. Listen to this. When we limit God and just give up to the, the normal course of nature and let it just run its course, and we call, close the case, I guess it's not going to happen, but I'm going to put out of my mind those scriptures that said all things are possible. See, that's, what, that's why I can't do it. Well, all things are possible, but nah, let's look, okay. We prayed for that. We didn't happen yet. Let's case closed. Oh, never mind. Just forget about it. But he should have acknowledged as Gabriel says to Mary, nothing will be impossible with God. Our sinful hearts of unbelief make us prone to limit God only by human potential. And we now believe and do everything and solve everything through human power empowerment and human potential. And we've left God out of the formula. Marley asked me, why do, why do you yell, Daddy? I'm like, I don't know. The disciples fell in that error, man. Here they are. They're faced with a crowd of 5,000 hungry men, plus the women and the children. Who knows how many were really there? I don't know. And so Yahshua turned to Philip. And this is, he said, hmm, where are we to buy bread that these may eat? And John goes on to say, this was a te he was testing Philip. You know what he said? There's a Publix right down the street here. Well, the fact is, they didn't have no money. They didn't have enough to do it. So his first thing was, that, okay, uh, this is what he said. 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. Okay, we're going we're gonna to take this money, and we're going to stretch it out. But guess what? We ain't got enough money. Bottom line, we ain't got enough money. Bottom line, we ain't got enough money. What are you going to do? We ain't got enough money. You see his, his mindset? He had faith for what he could see, but no faith for what he couldn't see. Philip was limiting God through the ability to work only through normal human means. And I want to tell you what, God has better for us than that. Somebody will just believe it. Some of you so old and wore out now, you're just done. You're done. You're done. And you can be young and be done. I don't know. Life's good. I don't want to go screw my life up with that. I've had them tell me. I'm going to tell you what. Yahweh has a completely different solution then and now. He, how, what did he do? He miraculously multiplied the few loaves of the fishes they had on hand. And he did it with just a small thing. And that's what God wants to do for us. But if you don't believe, if you still have doubt that God loves you, guess what? <laughs> You're never going to have faith to believe that he's going to bless you in the way that he wants to. Man, God bless me with a good job. I'm, I expect God to bless me way more than a job. 
If, we're, if it's just our job that's bringing our, our wealth to us, we're, we're in trouble. They'll shut it down, make you wear a mask, and, and not be able to have customers. You better be way. That's what, listen, there's something here that Yahweh has for me. I'm on it. I hope y'all do. Because I want it. I want it. I, and I, you know, and my life's good. I don't, I'm not complaining about my life. I'm not, you know, mad at God or nothing like that. But I tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to let God give me something and me be too stupid to use it. Or to not use it, I should say. Man, I've walked with God for years. Many of y'all with me. And when I'm faced with this seemingly impossible situation, I got to look at my heart. Because I'm prone to limit Yahweh by all the human possibilities. Now, if we read the Bible, you got to believe it. So when I show people the Bible, I say, well, how can you believe that? When it, what are you going to do with this scripture here? Guess what? They don't believe it. What's that? Doubt. So God's given us all this abundant evidence in his scripture that he is the God of the impossible. And that there's nothing too difficult for him. And the, the, so the source of my doubt is not a lack of evidence. It's rather, I don't believe the evidence. I don't know how long Zacharias and Elizabeth have been married. Surely 30 or 40 years. I don't, you know, I don't know. In that society, if you were childless, it was a matter of reproach. And they were praying those many years. They prayed that God give them a child and take away their reproach. And Yahweh didn't answer them. Now, to me, I, I have to think about that, what I said earlier. They were really wanting something for just their benefit and not the glory of God, maybe. And there's nothing wrong with wanting things for your benefit, but when, you're, when it goes to the motive of your heart, it could be a place of doubt. Now here they are. Now they're physically too old to have children. And they came to terms with that disappointment. Oh, we just love God. We're going to love Him anyhow. He just, we're not, he's not really want to give me what, what I asked for in His name. Just must not be God's will. So when the angel suddenly announced they would have a child, Zechariah doubted him. I think we've all been in that place. We prayed for something so long, and our request was so denied for so long that we just conclude this well, it's not going to happen. And you give up on your children because they're. They have, what do they call it? A dumb spirit. Give up on your kids. What about a kid with it? And we give up. We just quit praying because we're tired of it. I guess that's just God ain't going to do nothing. That's what's saying that God can't do nothing and that he don't love you enough to do it. But God said, hey, let me tell you what. And i got to be honest with you. If God would have made Bevy and I barren, I guess she would be the barren one, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, when we couldn't have ch children until right now, I'd be a lot better daddy. I'd be a good daddy, man. Back then, I don't know. I was like, I was all doing other stuff and, you know, and concerned about and consumed about other things. And I took time with my kids as best I, you know, thought I did and all that. And, uh, you know, if I'm going to preach the fatherhood principle, I've got to try to be one. And here they are, too old to have children. And Yahweh didn't forget what they asked him for. And he said, oh yeah. Bing! Zacharias, I'm Gabriel. Yahweh said, you're going to have a son. Then after we stop praying, sometimes there's a glimmer of hope that we're, they're about to be answered. 
Oh, my, my child's going to come back to God. You know, or well, this is going to work. It's going to. But we don't want to get our hopes up. Only to have them dashed again. So this is what I've heard people tell me. Let's wait and see. We'll just wait and see. We'll just wait and see. But in your heart, the reason is you're doubting God. I think a humorous story in the book of Acts, man, you know, we've told it many times, is, is how the early church who knew the true gospel knew Yeshua himself Herod Agrippa had executed the apostle James he arrested Peter going to put him to death just after Passover he Passover we're going to kill Peter too they prayed for James I'm sure you would think they would pray for James and when they prayed for James, they killed him. So I'm sure that when they prayed and that prayer didn't get answered, they got disappointed. You ever been disappointed by God? I thought it was God I was disappointed in. So then they arrest Peter and they said, hey, you know, we, we need to have another prayer meeting. Let's just pray. You know, our prayer is so full of baloney, it ain't even funny to me. Our prayer, you know, we pray, I don't even like praying in public because the Bible says don't do it. <laughs> Johnny, could you lead us in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you right now, these people that don't know the true gospel. I pray that, that you know what I mean? We're not even praying to God anyhow. We're praying, we're making a point. Oh, Lord, I pray for the people that don't come to church anymore. I pray to God you'll move in. You know, it's just baloney. Hey, Brother Johnny, would you pray for my sister? Yep. He ain't pray for his sister. I don't think God's going to do nothing anyhow. It's just how we do each other. Oh, do you have a prayer request? Oh, would you all pray? Well, I, hey, would you pray for such and such? That's why when I, when I tell somebody I'm praying for them now, I'm praying for them. Or I'll say, ah, I didn't pray for them. So here they are. Well, I guess we're, we're a church and all. We've got to have a prayer meeting, so let's pray. So they go into this house, and they begin to pray for Peter. And while they were praying, an angel miraculously delivered Peter from his prison cell. Get the story. Get the, how many gates he had to go through. And he went to where he figured they would be gathered and stood outside and was knocking on the door. And the servant girl recognized Peter's voice and got all excited. She forgot to let Peter in. So she ran in and said to the people that Peter's at the door. And guess what everybody said? No, he ain't. Yes, I heard him. It must be his angel. So they didn't even believe that what they were praying for came to pass, even when it came to pass, they, they were so like Didymus, doubter, doubting Thomas. No, he's not. Hey, man, I got healed, man. God healed me. No, he didn't. No, you're not. You're crazy. Or when we get an answer to prayer, we're so shocked. Oh, my God. What? Well, I think we should not with, a, with a haughtiness or pride. I think we should expect God to bless us and answer our prayer. But the reason we don't is because we have doubt. When we have doubt, then he can't do anything. What did Peter keep doing? Let me in this house. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 12, through 1 through 17, when they opened the door... <laughs> Of course, they were amazed that one of their prayers got answered. How many are glad that God in his grace and mercy also pours, uh, often pours us out blessings in spite of our doubts? Huh? I ain't talking about that. I ain't talking about that. That was Zechariah's, man. This is what he did. Yahweh disciplined him. 
But the fact is, God decided to use Zechariah and, and Elizabeth to bring forth something that he foretold and prophesied and said would happen. And when God foretold something and says it's going to happen, he, it's going to happen whether you believe or not. So he's like, oh, well, get, shut this idiot up. Get out of the way. See, part of the solution to our doubts is us to understand the source of these doubts that I've been trying to explain. We're all prone to doubts because we doubt in our heart. And, it comp- and it's coupled together and strengthened with disappointments and trials. And that's what Luke is trying to show us. That the solution for doubt is to see that God will do what he says he will do. Are you going to be like Adam and Eve and not believe it? Righteous as Zechariah was, he needs to learn that God's going to fulfill his promises. When he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Quit fretting and whining and worrying about it. And he's going to do it what he promises his way and his time. That's when we can kind of get messed up. Well, God's sovereign, or we think he should jump at every time we bark. Those are the two sides, man, of what we, we need this biblical balance. It's easy to yield to disappointment if God hadn't answered us the way we thought he should have. And what happens, our disappointment too leads to doubt. Let me tell you a story. Y'all know I had that thing on my nose? Did y'all see it? Can you see it? It's gone. Let me tell you why it's gone. Because every, every day, I cursed it. Every single day, I laid hands on it. I, when I get in the shower, I lay hands on things that hurt. I'm like, Lord, help me. I pray for this shoulder. I rebuke this. I rebuke sickness. I rebuke. And I, I would curse that thing every day. And I asked God, I wanted that thing gone. So I thought I'd go to the doctor, who was my maxillofacial dental surgeon, friend of mine in Gainesville. And so, look, I want want you to kind of laser that off for me again. And the guy said, uh, uh, we're not going to do that. He said, I got to take a biopsy. So he went in there and took a little plug out of it, and he came back and he said, I was at stage zero of cancer. I mean, stage zero? What's that? Well, it's not one or two or three or four, it's zero. It's in one place, it's localized, it's not spreading, it's just that right there. I said, I really don't mind stage zero if you don't have symptoms, right? So I said, and I think it, it has the ability or potential, whatever. So he said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to cut the end of your nose off. And we're probably going to cut a slit right here and pull this skin down and graft it on the end of your nose. The only thing good about that is getting up an act in the movie Star Trek. <laughs> what are they called, Joel? Klingons. I'm like, well, can we just... Can't we just kind of just see? Nope. I do 20 of these a a day. Your surgery's tomorrow. I say, well, you'll be doing 19 tomorrow. (laughs) And I said, I don't want to have my nose cut off. The first thing he said to me was this. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you what you can do. You know, you you can get a prosthetic nose that has magnets. And you just stick it right there. So I was thinking, I said, man, what happens? You, you know, I lose my keys. I can lose things like that. You know, I'm thinking. So I, I, thought, I thought of a place I could keep it, stick it to the refrigerator. You know, I say, honey, have you seen my nose? It's on the refrigerator, honey. So I'm like, Yahweh. I don't want to do that. I got counsel from some people. Don't let those people do that. Well, it was two weeks later, this guy that 
He's a retired gentleman that does the golf carts where I play golf. His name's Tim, Italian last name. And he said, hey, you know, I got some of this cream. He said, I'm not using it anymore. I had some skin cancer taken off, and, and he had a spot there that was like a, a big spot. And he said, but I'm done with it because I asked that surgeon, I said, can you give me some of that cream? No. Cling on. <laughs> Dude, I'd rather just be dead. I ain't lying to you have a nose yet, you know, that you put on with a. I, be, I would be the first to wear a mask, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so he said, I got this cream, man. You ought to try it on your nose. And I, you know, not only was it there, but I played, you know, I, I'm out in the sun a lot and all that kind of stuff, and it got darker and darker and darker and darker and darker and darker. So I said, yeah, I'll try it. He said, you do this right here. And I'll tell you what y'all we did. Y'all we answered my prayer the way he wanted to. It's gone now. And I learned a lot of humility through all that. You know, I didn't care what some people thought. My wife loves me. Y'all love me. I don't care if anybody likes that thing on my nose or not. It is irrelevant. But it's like a story that I heard Kenneth Hagin tell one time. I was in a conference and he was speaking. And Kenneth Hagin said this. And, and you know, I, I doctrinally don't agree with a lot of what Kenneth Hagin said, but he could tell a good story, man. I used to love to sit with him and just let him tell these stories. They were such beautiful stories. And he said when he was back in the 60s, he was traveling as an evangelist. And they were going out west. And they were going through like a desert place. And, and they, they didn't have any money. And, and he said he gets there and the uh, and car starts chugging a little bit. And it runs out of gas. And him and his wife are there. They have any gas. And they had a little bit of money, but there was no way to get to the gas station. So he tells, he tells a story. He said, I, I took, put the hood up on my car. And I took the air breather off. This was old 60s. And he said, I put my hands on that carburetor and started commanding gas. Asking God, Phil, I need gas in my car, Yahweh. I command gas with this car. Well, by that time, here comes a, a Volkswagen bus full of a bunch of hippies. You know, they were smoking the weed and all that. And they said, hell, man, what, what are you doing, old man? He said, man, I got my hands on here. I'm asking God to give me some gas. Hallelujah. And they scoffed at him and laughed at him and said, ha, man, you fool. He said, they said, but we got a five-gallon can in the back back here. And we'll sell it to you. He said, I'll do it. Boo, 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 boo. They went off laughing. He went off praising God. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? I'm going to allow God to be sovereign, but I believe that if he said he's going to do something, I'm, I'm going to believe he's going to do it. Even if, if it takes a different form than what I expected it to take. I don't really care how. Brother Johnny, I'm praying for my children. They'll come home. Well, be careful. So it goes on, you know. People think that, as Luke was talking to Theophilus, the guy he wrote to in the book of Luke, See, a lot of people think that doubt is just a leap of, and the opposite of doubt is just a leap of faith into dark. And I don't think that. We know that we have a prophetic word from God. That he said this, 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 and this, and I can't believe this if I can't believe that. I think it's ridiculous to, for we to say, you know, when people, people that believe that when you die, you, your, your spirit man just flies out and you go to heaven and you get your, you know, you're healed before you get there, even before you get your new body. That's one of the things that confused me. But they fly up to this place where there are streets of gold. There are gates made out of one giant pearl. And you get a mansion there, of course. Nobody said, we get a tent. And you get mansions there and... and you know, we're, we're happy when that's all we do. And then the bad folks go and burn in this fire forever and ever. Though they never burn, they don't burn up. But they, I think that's a lot harder to believe than that God will heal your son of diabetes. But yet we just say, yeah, I believe it. But I don't think we really do because that doubt in our heart that we got to uncover it and discover and recover. 
Man, you got these things that Yahweh promised. He said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. He prophesied John coming. He prophesied uh, Yahshua coming. And this is the last point I want to make in my, in my soft closing. In the book of Luke, what he's really doing is he's driving home this point, And that is this. Yahweh, what Yahweh says he will do, he will do. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, he's trying to make Theophilus and everybody else that reads, read that synoptic gospel. That if Yahweh says he's going to do it, he'll do it. Now we get back into the, the problem in the, in the garden. But if you don't really believe that God is and that, that he can do it or will do it, then you will never believe and have faith. In verse 18, Zechariah expresses the reason for his doubt. He tells us, are y'all ready? He said this, are y'all ready? I'm an old man. I'm an old man. I'm an old man. I'm an old man. Will you please don't use that lame, stupid excuse to stop believing that Yahweh will answer your prayer? Or to slow down your faith. I refuse to believe that for me and this house that the greatest things we've ever done by faith does not remain in my past as a young man. But my greater days will be in my latter days. Yeah, but I'm an old man, Johnny. That's just a lame excuse for your doubt and unbelief and laziness. And you can have that attitude and not even be old yet. One of the worst things in the world is for a man to die at 40 and they not bury him till he's 80. If you know what I'm saying. In the Greek, man, it's in this expression, it's called ego emi, E I M I. Imimi. And this is how Gabriel responds by using the same expression. Zechariah says, I am old. And Gabriel said, I'm Gabriel. That's really how the Greek reads. Who stands in the presence of God. And I've been sent to speak to you. Yeah, but I'm old. Let him... I'm Gabriel, and I'm here from the presence of God, and I got something to tell you. You're going to have a son, and you can either have one set of footprints, or you can have some footprints, a set of footprints, and drag lines, because I'm going to drag you there, Zacharias, because I said I would. It's a deliberate contrast between the feebleness of man's word and the power of God's word. It's as if Gabriel said this, you might be an old man and you may not be able to father a child, but I'm no less than the angel who stands in the very presence of God and I come to speak to you in your word and it's going to come to pass. Oh man. Can I tell you today? That the word of God overcomes the word of man. Will somebody believe? Will somebody have faith? The word of God is more powerful than the words of man. So I know and I believe in the prophetic word of God. That which was prophesied and come to pass. That's, that's faith was something we could have evidence with. God spoke it. And later, God did what he said he would do. 
I'm sure that when Cain was born, because of the promise of the seed of the woman bruising the serpent's head, I'm sure that when she gave birth to Cain in that garden, she assumed that God had given her a man-child. And she assumed that was the deliverer, that was the Savior, that was the Messiah, that was the Redeemer that taketh away the sins of the world, that would rule the world and put man back in right standing. She was wrong. But, but you can't blame her because that's what we think. We think, oh, right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. I'll tell you what, I read in the Bible God spoke and later did what he said he would do. He didn't forget after all those many years, it was all his plan working out. And we have to understand how he works and that strengthens my faith. You mean to tell me when you think that Cain is the Messiah, but he ain't, and we got this all this time to come. The Bible also has many scriptures that have yet to be fulfilled. And I can assure you that everything, and I want you to be clear, that in our day, everything that God said will happen is going to happen. That's seen. That's evidence. But now I'm going to talk to you about one last thing. This is hard close. I told you that in order to get our well done, we have to have the spirit word, not just the word. And I know we got a lot more to learn about the word. It's inexhaustible, insearchable, blah, blah, blah. I know that. And I'm not putting that down. And we're going to continue to learn that and lo- learn that and get it in our hearts and minds and souls and, and more as he reveals to us. But years ago, we were strong in spirit, but weak in word. Now we're strong in word, but weak in spirit. And so, I mean, so what you can't do, you can't show favoritism. Okay, now we're going to go do spirit. No, no, no. It's one thing. And this is something that we must learn to do. The known, the seen, the evidence of faith is pretty easy to just accept and believe it once your eyes are open. You know, you don't go to heaven when you die. How many of you know, man, you don't even think about that no more. You just think, man, those people are ignorant. How can they think that? Look at this. The Bible says this, 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 and this. So we have faith in that, and it's settled. You know, Satan. I mean, it's just, it's just facts. It's evidence. As Yahshua said, it's written. So that's not our issue. Most of us, we've already, we're getting over our doubt about that because the traditions that you had in you would make you afraid. Well, God, it's not true. We're going to heaven when I die in Jesus. You know, what about in the name of blah, blah, blah. You know, we have those things. But most people have, that, are, have, that are here now have pretty much overcome those things. But listen to me, and I want everyone to hear me. We too must prophesy things that have yet to happen. Because until we prophesy them, they have no chance to coming to pass. We have to speak to the mountain. We have to speak to the brown. Joel says, I used to brown nose God. You have, to, you have to speak. You have to have faith. You can't be timid. You can't be ashamed. You can't be afraid it won't work. I know that through Yahweh's loving discipline, because who he loveth, he correcteth. It's a sign of spiritual sonship when you've been corrected. And although our doubts don't keep God from, through his mercy and grace, blessing us according to what he's promised, he will and I have to say this for people, lovingly discipline us in our doubts because 
so we can share in His holiness. Let me tell you what God, the angel did to Zacharias. He struck him deaf and dumb. Dumb, so he quit saying those doubtful filled words. Deaf, so he quit listening to that junk. Be careful what you're hearing. By doubting the ambassador and the representative and angel of the Lord, guess what Zechariah was doing? He doubted God. And God don't like that. He don't like he takes it serious when you call him a liar. I didn't call him a liar. Okay. But you don't believe him. I don't believe him. We don't believe him. He wants us to believe him. It pleases him. He loves it. Listen to what he said. He taught Zechariah a lesson, a loving lesson, that he will never forget. In chapter 1, verse 20, the angel specifically states Zechariah's problem and his sin. He said, Zechariah, it's because you did not Believe my words. Are y'all hearing me today? That's simple. You don't believe me. You don't believe my words. Chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 45. Elizabeth exclaims to Mary by saying, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Blessed are you for believing that what God said is going to happen is going to happen. There's your faith. Since God will fulfill His word, we should be believing like Mary, not unbelieving like Zechariah. He shut his mouth in silence. What he should have been doing with his mouth is appreciating and praising God. Because he knew he had the word. He knew God was going to do it. He had the promise. He believed it. And he worshiped and praised him. What if I say it and praise God for something that hadn't happened yet? That's faith for the unseen or the no evidence. Yeah, but what if it don't happen? It probably ain't going to happen because you don't believe it. Is that hard? It's almost so simple, it's not hard. Let me tell you something about doubt that I've learned. Doubt has nothing to say. But faith can't keep his mouth shut. It opens our heart and it opens our lips and prays to God. But doubt will refuse to speak because of fear and unbelief. Rise up and walk. You ain't going to say that. I'll tell you what. My confession to you this morning is over the years I've become timid to those kind of things. I've become timid. And my doubt has kept my mouth shut. But I'm not going to keep my mouth shut anymore. I don't need to protect Yahweh. He said, don't worry about it. You just believe what I say. You say it. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed of it. And I got to tell you what. I've never obeyed God and it brought shame to me or reproach on me. God's nothing to do make me look good. And that's faith. To believe he can make me look good. If Zechariah had spent those silent months grumbling about how unfair God was, you know, he struck me deaf and dumb. Well, you know why you're in the position you're in today? Because you're unbelief. Quit blaming God for the stuff that we self-inflict ourselves with. We got to stop it. We got to learn from this man. 
Some of us are, uh, the junk's going on through in our lives. You know what's Well, Let me tell you why. Because we just keep doubting God. Well, I tell you, Brother John, I remember when I gave my life to the Lord, I quit doing all this kind of stuff. Yeah, but you ain't doing nothing now. You, you're doubt. You have doubt in your heart. And you receive nothing from the Lord. What's God? What am I going through? What's I'm doing? It's, you're inflicting yourself. You've got to have faith for, in order for God to do what he says he's going to do for you to receive it. And if you do, nothing's impossible to you. And I'm going to say it whether you believe it or not. And I want to walk. I want us to walk in it. No matter of faith and doubt, the crucial thing is not our feelings. And the crucial thing is not even our faith. Are you listening? So if it's not our feelings and it's not our faith, what is it, Johnny? The crucial thing is the object of our faith. I know people who have faith. But they believe in stuff that's ineffective. Let me, here, here's an example. Let's say you're needing to get somewhere pretty quick. You go to the airport. They say, okay, we've got one flight going out. We're going to take it anyhow. But, and I know you're in a hurry. You've got to get somewhere. But this plane doesn't work good. It has a tendency to stall in the air. And we're not even sure if it's going to make it. And you can say, well, I have the faith that it will. And it crashes. See? This faith that we're talking about is about the object of our faith. To have great faith in an airplane that don't work but will crash in spite of your faith is not a plane that you can put your faith into. It's an untrustworthy plane. Are y'all getting it? Now watch this. Now you can have big faith in that plane that don't work. And you will crash. But you can have a little faith in an airplane that is in perfect condition. Just enough that gets you on board. And that's all it takes to get you from here to where you're going. Just enough faith to get you on board. Just to get up. But the, the issue is it's not your faith, whether it's great or small, in the sense more that it's the object of what you're believing in that the, matters the most. Luke is trying to tell us in his Gospel. He wants us to see that God is the good plane. Put your faith in Him. He's faithful to His promises. We can trust Him. He has a proven track record. I know by certain things where I stand with God in my relationship, whether I'm hot or cold. One thing is if I love people, if my love level starts dropping, I know I'm letting the flesh get me. But the worst and the biggest sign, though, is when I start doubting that God will do what He said. This morning... I don't want to doubt it. I want to believe him. I want to nurture my faith. I want to quit living the, all the cares of life and all the world, living after the world, and because it's just robbing me and draining me of my faith. So when my trial comes, guess what? I'm not, I'm, I'm not strong enough to, to affect them. I want to be filled with the word. I want to be filled with the spirit. I want to speak with boldness, not just as from a young man out of his youth, but out of a man of experiential knowledge that there is nothing impossible with my God. I can believe it from my experience, evidence, and I can believe him for things 
that where there is no evidence. I love you this morning. I hope, hope this seed I've sown in you, you'll receive it. I hope you don't go home today and let the, the, the birds of the air come and take this from you. I hope we get this and as a body, we begin to walk in the faith that God's called us to walk in and that there'll be nothing impossible for us. Uh, and we'll start believing God for the great, mighty, wonderful things. Amen?